know that you can still break those bonds and those chains that, that uh, binds us sometimes and habits and, and things that uh, that we know that in our heart that we need to deal with. So we pray for those issues that we're struggling with and those issues that we uh, cope with and we those worries that we uh, keep carrying with us and we just pray that you would help us to understand that we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us and help us to trust your word. We pray, Father, for the, the message this morning as our pastor comes that you would guide his thoughts and direct his words as he speaks uh, for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take care of some basic business right now. First of all, if you're a little warm, you'll probably want to take off the jacket or whatever because otherwise I'll be noticing that you're asleep probably in about 10, 12 minutes. If you're cold and somebody that's taken off their sweater, just grab it. I'm sure that you can give it back to them later and uh, we can take care of that. Also, I'd like to thank Brother Joe for reminding us that this is, in fact, the first day of the week. We love it when people have a wonderful weekend and go to the lake or do whatever they want to do. Uh, Buddy and I were kidding around about a motorcycle ride that he was going to make this weekend. He just never made it. <laughs> and uh, the reality is, is that Sunday is the first day of the week. So enjoy your weekend and do all those things you got to do. But the first day of the week, bring it to the Lord's house. Be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Fellowship with each other, grow in the Word. Those are important things to do. Now, talking about removing the mask, how many of y'all are aware of the fact that this is Mardi Gras season? Now, it's really, okay, I want to make sure you understand. It's really festive. Because Mardi Gras is the word in French, Fat Tuesday, which is one day, and that's going to come. So, to say it's Mardi Gras season is right. Uh, in the sense that they're interested in that sort of thing. Generally, it's the, the pagan side of our culture and Roman Catholicism that are involved with that. And, uh, and as Baptists, we're not much on uh, celebrating uh, the freedom to sin until you get to the time of year when you stop sinning. Uh, it's just, that doesn't work biblically. So uh, keep those things in mind that there's a tradition in Mardi Gras that works like this. On Fat Tuesday, which is Mardi Gras, you wear a mask. And the reason for the mask is that for 24 hours, you get to be whoever you want to be. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a have or have not. or what. You are whoever you want to be with the mask on. It's sort of like... You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens with the mask on day, that's just your thing. And so, unfortunately, even though that kind of works for a festival season, uh, it also happens that this is a problem that we allow ourselves to get involved with in the church. That there is an appearance that we want to put out there that is not necessarily in keeping with what's going on behind the mask. So sometimes we're hurting, but we leave people with the impression we're fine. Sometimes we're in desperate need of answers, but we're afraid to go and ask people who might be able to help us find the answers to the questions that we have. Sometimes we're uh, giving the impression that we're living a very uh, holy and godly life, when in fact we may be struggling with some particular sin, you name it, uh, that is a stronghold or a difficulty in our personal life. And so this mask is something that the enemy uses to keep us trapped in a way of life that Jesus is trying to set us free from to walk in the joy of the Lord as his followers. He wants to set us free from that purpose. And so we want to look at how this happens in the church in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, I want y'all to see that here are all the disciples. This is after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come. Various things are already going on in the church that are really good things. People are being saved. 
and the Spirit of God is at work. And so here we are in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Now notice in this particular passage, the indication of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not followed with speaking in tongues. And a lot of people who are focused on that miss the point. Here's the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit in this passage. They begin to speak the word with boldness. So it's a witness effect. And you remember Jesus told them that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Here's the special work of the Holy Spirit to empower them for that purpose. So we can be excited in the church that we have the same Holy Spirit that they had whenever they were born again believers in this particular point in time. And as we submit ourselves to God and we're in the word, his spirit can fill us and will create in us a desire to go out and to speak the word of God in our families, in our workplace, in our community, wherever it might be, and not to do it sheepishly, but to do it with the empowerment of God, with boldness. Well, notice it says, in the congregation of those who believe. This is not the people who just kind of came in to see what was going on. But these were the born-again followers of Jesus. These were the real deal folks. And so here they are. They're in one heart and one soul. Now, I would have you guess with me real quick what heart they are sharing and what soul they are sharing. But the Spirit of God, the mind of Christ, the desires of God. And so here they are, not one of them claiming that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Time out. This is not socialism. The way socialism works is the government decides you're going to give it up and they're going to share it. The way the church works is that the body of Christ looks at each other and says, if you need anything I have, you let me know and I'll share it with you. It is a personal commitment to each other like family, not a governmental control. And so in this reality, you go on to verse, uh, uh, well, it says 34. Did we skip a verse? Let me see well, let's go with it. For there is not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sales, lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would distribute to each as any had need. So this is how they're taking care of each other. Now in the midst of this, we have a fellow in the church, and he's just one of the Levitical priests that has come to Christ. And you look in verse 36. It says then that now Joseph, a Levite by Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. What was his spiritual gift, you think? He got his spiritual gift turned into a name. He was walking around being called his spiritual gift, son of encouragement. And who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So let's, let's take a look at what we have so far. <clears throat> the church, filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly preaching the gospel. Miraculous things are having, happening. People are being saved. They're being baptized. The church is growing by sometimes thousands as an apostle preaches. And folks are saved and they're baptized. And things are going pretty well. Here they are actually showing sacrificial love to each other in the body. And it all sounds really good. And so how long do you think the devil is going to leave that alone? Well, let's look then at chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself. With his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now we're setting up a situation where somebody's wearing a mask. We're going to take this money and we're going to leave the impression that we sold the property and here's all the money. When in fact, that's not what happened at all. Notice if you would in verse 3. 
But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? How did Peter know that? I don't think anybody human-wise told him that. I think that this was going to be a special moment that was going to happen in the church that would let the church know how God still felt about sin and hypocrisy and deception. Even within a body of born-again believers that we're still held accountable by the circumstances of our choices. Now, don't get the impression that Ananias or his wife are not believers. There's nothing in this text that tells us that they were not. It gives the impression that they were a part of the body. And remember that congregation of those who believed. And so, while it remained unsold, Peter said, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's go back. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? And so here is this moment that we see in James chapter 1 where our lust then comes along and it starts trying to carry us away. You ever been carried away by something? Come on, we just had Thanksgiving and Christmas. You looked at the table and you said, I am just not going to overdo it this year. And then later in the afternoon you said, oh, I ate the whole thing. Y'all remember that commercial? I ate the whole thing. All right. We were carried away. Well, here's the thing that Satan delivered in his mailbox. And he opened the mail and looked it over and he was being carried away. Excuse me. By this temptation. So he says, why is it that you have conceived this deed? All right. The temptation is not sin. Do we understand that? Being tempted, not a sin. Taking the temptation, opening up, and beginning to work in the process of how to do this act or think this thing or be carried away by it more fully. This is when we're in danger and involving ourselves in sin. Why have you conceived this deed in your heart? And then he says the obvious thing that has become obvious to him. You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so here we are as the body of Christ. We're serving God. And we're working in various ways. And we're trying to live according to the word of God. And we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we can't do it ourselves. And yet, here's some real struggle, some real need, or some way we present ourselves that is not true. And the reality is, is that God is not the one inspiring us to wear the mask. It's the enemy. And as we wear the mask, we're actually not just lying to the people around us, but we're lying to God to say that what I'm doing, I think, is A-OK. -okay. When the reality of it is, it's not. See, we're called to speak the truth in love. That is the, the way that we're supposed to be in the body of Christ. How do we minister to each other? How do we help each other and meet each other's needs if, in fact, we're living a lie? Well, is this a serious problem or not? Does God have a problem with this at all? Well, let's look at verse 5. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. Wow. And great fear came over all who heard it. Now you know the tradition in the Middle East to this day is the same. If somebody dies, you mourn for them rapidly. You wrap them, you bury them before the sun goes down in Islam. It's not quite that much in, in the Jewish culture, but in Islam, I mean, before the sun is gone, you bury it. And so the young men got up, covered him up, and after carrying them out, they buried him. In keeping with the culture, he said it's a little fast. That's the way they did it. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. Guess who didn't know about the funeral? It's a fire. She came in not knowing what had happened. Notice it says in verse 8. 
Peter responded to her, Hey, by the way, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? You see, she was accountable for her own actions. She wasn't going to die because of what Ananias had done. He asked her, did y'all do it this way? She responded, yes. What if she had said, that's why I came to see you. I, I wanted to tell you that, that what we've done is wrong. That we, in fact, held back some of the money. Do you think she would have faced the same fate? No. Because she had a repentant heart. Because she would have been responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. She would have cut that sin cycle short and have done what God wanted her to do. And so she says, yes, that's the price. And then having done that, she put the Lord to the test. Do I put the Lord to the test? Based on this story, the answer is yes. And so do you. We all are walking around at times wearing masks, hiding the reality of of the hurts in our lives, or the sins in our lives, or the struggles in our lives, when in reality, uh, we just want everybody to think we're fine. That's what we want, everybody to think I'm fine. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Isn't that what you hear all morning long? Yeah, we're all fine. Except we're lying to ourselves, we're lying to the people around us, and we're lying to God about the reality of our sin, struggles, and life. And so, behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. She just found out about the funeral, and just moments later, she's going to be headed to her.